Now it's my pleasure to introduce Maria Echeveste. Uh, Maria is the president and CEO of the Opportunity Institute, where she oversees executive and administrative duties, including day-to-day -day activities, development, and budgets, and directs programmatic work. She's built a distinguished career working as a consultant, a lecturer, a senior White House official, a longtime community leader, and corporate attorney. In the words of Beyonce, who runs the world? Girls. Currently, Maria serves on the board of directors at UCSF uh, Benioff Oakland Children's Hospital, Mi Familia Vota, and Alliance for a Healthier Generation. Welcome, Maria. Thank you, Kristen, for the introduction, and thank you all for joining us today. The issues raised in this report regarding inequitable opportunities is personal for me. Growing up as the eldest of seven children, born to a poor Mexican farm worker family, California's investments in education gave us, all of us, the opportunity to achieve the American dream. When California was among the top five states in per student education funding, my siblings and I received a high quality education, even in a little rural district in Fresno County or later in the Oxnard Barrio in Ventura County, sufficient to prepare me to uh, be admitted to Stanford University and then again obtain a law degree from UC Berkeley. And five of my other six siblings were able to graduate from college. I will forever be grateful to my parents that they had the good sense to move to California from Texas. Under then Governor Pat Brown, California was laying the foundation for building a strong and diverse economy with opportunity for many with little. But that has changed over the last four decades. Too many residents of the Golden State are now unable to achieve the American, the California dream. We've seen rising inequality, less investment in education, more children growing up in poverty, even in the fifth largest economy in the world. The pandemic has shown a light on these growing inequities. And we know that this is not just an issue of economic inequity, but also racial justice. Proposition 13 is one example of how a progressive state has allowed policies to stay on the books, even as they perpetuate inequity. The California that passed Proposition 13 is not the California of today. Greater diversity, shifting values. We should know better. We can revisit decisions of the past and better align our policies with the California we want for our children. I am proud to be leading an organization that is not afraid to take on hard issues and I'm proud to be a co-sponsor co of this report. I would like to turn this now to, hold on a second. Um, uh, forgive me, I can't find the run of show. It's, it's me, back to me. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. I'm so sorry. I'm as you know, too many screens. So back to Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are like, um, what, the news channel. Back to you, Kristen. Um, so I, I think what Maria said kind of really resonated with me and I know resonates with a lot of young people. Um, I am a first generation college student uh, and was able to uh, set the path for my younger brother to go to college and also for my mom to go to college. Uh, and the same way with purchasing a home, uh, I, I was able to purchase a home here in California as well. Um, so I do understand being able to overcome barriers and, and really having to fight uh, for economic security. So thank you so much for those comments. Um, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Arun Ramanathan and Carrie Hanel, the co-authors of the Unjust Legacy Report. Uh, Dr. Arun Ramanathan is the CEO of Pivot Learning. And prior to join, joining Pivot Learning Partners, Dr. Ramanathan served as the executive director of the Education Trust West, the leading education policy, research, and advocacy organization focused on closing achievement and opportunity gaps for low-income students and students of color. Before his time at the Education Trust West, he was chief student services officer in the San Diego Unified School District, charged with, excuse me, charged with leading special education 
and multiple other departments, including mental health, nursing and counseling with combined budgets exceeding $350 million. He's published opinion editorials on a range of education topics in California and nationally has been featured on NPR, local radio and television. Welcome, Dr. Ramanathan. Next up, we have Carrie Hanel. Carrie is the Senior Director of Policy and Strategy at the Opportunity Institute. Her work focuses on improving systems of school finance, education resource briefs, education resource briefs and reports on improving adequacy and equity in California school funding system. Previously, she worked as an interim co-executive director and director of research and policy at the Education Trust West, a nonprofit advocacy group focused on educational justice. She's also served as director of research and evaluation for the KIPP Foundation. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you, Kristen. It is an honor to be here today to talk about the new report, Pivot Learning and Opportunity Institute have released called Unjust Legacy. This has truly been a collaborative effort between our two organizations. And so I'm very proud to be here with my co-author, Arun Ramanathan, to discuss the report and present our work. Um, I'd also be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge our two additional co-authors who are not with us today, Jacobo Bassetto and Andrea Serrato. They were integral to developing the methods and generating the findings I'm going to discuss today. Um, if we can pull up the slides, I would love to take you through the findings. Um, you can also find these slides on the, uh, the this report on the Opportunity Institute website. The, the address is right there. And the report, while lengthy, does have a, a lot of additional detail we're not going to get to today, including some information on Prop 13's history and a deeper discussion of its effects on educational equity and economic opportunity. Go to the next slide. Um, before diving into the findings, I do want to provide a little bit of background on Prop 13 for those of you who might be less familiar with it, or perhaps for those of you who are outside of California. Uh, Prop 13 was a ballot initiative passed by California voters in 1978, so 44 years ago now. And it did um, a number of things. A few of them are listed here. Um, most importantly, it capped the property tax rate at 1%, and it allowed assessments to only increase 2% per year. It also said that a property could only be a, could be reassessed only when it was sold. And it also established that a two thirds vote majority rather than a simple majority would be required to pass any new special tax in a local election. So it made it harder to pass local taxes. Now, ostensibly Prop 13 was fueled by economic circumstances, including rise, rising inflation, rising home values, soaring property tax bills, and many have documented this. Um, these are facts. There was also voter frustration and perception of government overspending. But what's less well documented is the, the other set of facts that Prop 13 had racist roots and antecedents. Exclusionary zoning, redlining, and other segregating and racially discriminatory policies that happened before 1978 mean that Prop 13, when it was passed, came on top of neighborhood segregation, school segregation, and policies that prevented people of color from growing housing wealth. So how did Prop 13 contribute to inequities after it was passed? Let's turn to the next slide and um, start to go into our research findings. Uh, first, in the report, you'll find that we looked at housing wealth and we asked the question, how has the accrual of residential property wealth by race changed over the past 40 years? And to answer this question, we use census data. We use the US Census and also the American Community Survey data. And these surveys are really great because they allow us to use self-reported home values. And we were able to disaggregate those by a number um, of dem demographic variables. And we found that housing wealth disparities, on um, the next slide please, have widened over time. Now, um, and so what you'll see here is that each bar represents the total housing wealth, the value of all the homes in California, and then divided by racial groups. So you can see that in 2019, 60% of the housing wealth in California was owned by white Californians. And that, that number or that percentage has declined over time, but it's also true that the percentage of the population that is white has dramatically declined over time. Um, 
The other thing that is true is that white Californians still own a disproportionate share of the state's housing wealth. So relative to their share of the population, they own more of the housing wealth than one would expect. By contrast, black homeowners own just 3% of the total housing wealth, even though 6% of Californians are black. And for Asian Americans, uh, the pattern is quite interesting. They have acquired housing wealth at a pace that exceeds their population growth in California. And then when we look at Latino, the Latino population, even though it has soared between 1980 and 2020 um, by 20 percentage points, their housing wealth has only increased by seven percentage points in that same time frame. So we see that there are these existing and inequity, um, growing inequities in housing wealth in California. If you go to the next slide, we see that in addition, the average home values have risen dramatically over the 40 years that we looked at, um, especially for the most expensive homes. So the average home has increased in value by about 660% over this 40 year period of time. Actually 39 years is what we were able to look at. Now that's a significant gain for those who have had access to the housing market. Um, for those who have been lucky enough to see growing equity in their home, um, this has been a tremendous lever for economic opportunity. By contrast, renters have had less, they haven't had the same access to the accrual of housing wealth, of course. Um, this is also a gain that far exceeds the rate of inflation. And those who are in the top quintile, so the 20% most expensive homes, which is that top bar, the blue bar that you see growing up there, these are snapshots in time, but you see that the top 20% of homes have grown in um, value faster than all the others. And they've in fact increased in value by more than 800%. This means that those with the most property wealth have gotten wealthier over this period of time. And it's important to point out that the Californians who own the most expensive homes are also disproportionately white and higher income. Next in the report, we looked at property tax savings. If you can go to the next slide, um, the research question we asked here is which homeowners most benefit from California's cap on property taxes? Again, we use the American Community Survey, this time looking at 2019 alone. And, um, if you go to the next slide, the, I'd like to talk a little bit about how, how this actually works. So one of the important things about the way in which Prop 13 was designed, and this was, this was, uh, this was the, the, the main construct of the, the, the measure, is it was designed to give homeowners a tax break. What this means is that owners of similar homes can pay very different taxes. Prop 13 caps property taxes at 1%, but the effective tax rate is often lower than that since most properties are assessed at below market value because of course they're only increasing 2% per year. So we talk in this report about effective tax rates. And when we, talk, when we say effective tax rate, we mean the actual tax paid divided by the estimated market value. So consider what you see on the screen here. This is a comparison of similar homes in Fullerton, California. We pulled the, these data right off of Zillow um, and we looked at many different communities in California and found similar trends. Um, but what you can see is that when we look at a few different properties that are very similar to each other, these are all three bed, two bath homes, all similar square footage, more or less in the same range of value. You can see that those homeowners pay very different property taxes. The, the, the first house, the blue one, number one there, that homeowner who bought their house in 1996 pays just under $3,000 a year in property tax. Whereas house number four, the purple one, that homeowner who bought the house in 2020 pays $11,700 in property tax. So a dramatic difference annually in property taxes. And of course, that money stacks up over time. So this isn't a single year of benefit. This is a multi-year benefit that grows in value the longer somebody owns their home. Now, what this means is that people who have owned their home longer, and these also tend to be older Californians, it, it enjoy the greatest benefit from, um, the, from the policy. And that's of course by design. If you go to the next slide. In our report, we described this savings as a tax subsidy. And by subsidy, we mean the difference between what homeowners would hypothetically pay if they were paying the Prop 13 1% tax rate, plus we put on an additional 10th of a percentage point, recognizing that there are locally assessed fees, bonds, and other parcel taxes that might show up on the, the tax bill. 
So, so it's what they're paying, um, you know, what they would pay if it was 1%, 1.1% of market value, um, the difference between that and what they actually paid in taxes, and that's the subsidy. Now, because the structure of Prop 13 is what it is, the differences, and go to the next slide, please, the differences by homeowner race are not as pronounced as the differences by age or by the length of ownership. In theory, this is a race neutral policy, but regardless of race, Californians who have owned their homes for many years benefit from significant subsidies and new homeowners pay the full freight. And despite the modest disparity in tax rates, racial differences are more evident in the dollar value of the tax subsidy since home values vary by race. So what was meant to be a race neutral policy in actuality is not because we know that people of color have less access to the housing market, have less opportunity to have high value homes and therefore um, are enjoying less of a subsidy from the policy. Next slide, please. Finally, we estimated in our report hypothetical revenues and we asked the research question, how much more revenue could the state theoretically generate if it changed its property tax policies and how might school districts benefit? Importantly, I wanna acknowledge that we didn't try to model a specific change to Prop 13. There are many different options and we might discuss some of that on the webinar today. The details of those policy changes really matter. Um, so we didn't model a specific change, but we ran two scenarios. In the first scenario on the next slide, we looked at California's property tax revenues as a share of personal income relative to a handful of other states that we um, chose as comparison states. And we found that in theory, California can generate about $41 billion more if it collected the same amount of property tax as a share of personal income as New York. Um, and about $3 billion more if it collected about the same amount as a share of personal income as Florida. And you see that the, the, the differences are quite large for some of these states, quite small for others, um, demonstrating that property tax policies really vary across states. And again, the details matter here, but what this suggests is that given California's wealth, there might be room in its economy to generate additional tax revenue through its property tax. The next slide shows our second scenario. And we, we wanted to run this a couple of different ways. We spent a lot of time in our report talking about effective tax rates. And in California, the effective tax rate is 0.7%. The national average is a little higher at 0.9%. It's much higher in places like New York and Illinois that have effect, effective tax rates of one and a half to 2%. And so we wanted to know if California had effective tax rates similar to other comparison states, how much more revenue could we generate? And we found similar ranges here. You see be, between Florida and New York, um, Florida and Illinois, rather, there's a range of something like 3 billion to 40 billion. So a really wide range, but more than we're currently generating. So in the next slide, you'll see that we, we picked based on these scenarios, a midpoint estimate that we felt to be relatively conservative. Conservative in part because we are looking only at primary residential properties. We're not looking at vacation homes. We're not looking at commercial properties, which are all generate additional revenue with changes to the tax system potentially. Just with this modest kind of set of properties that we're looking at, we estimated a $20 billion additional revenue um, windfall that could be realized, which for Cal California K-12 education would be roughly $7 billion or $1,200 per pupil. What could that buy? For uh, a mid-sized elementary school, for example, potentially six additional staff think librarians, teachers, counselors, um, and reductions of class size by two students for every class, just as a couple of examples. But like I said, the details of the design um, of the policy solution really matter, and there are many paths forward. So for a discussion of what those options are and some considerations for what needs to happen next, I'm going to hand it over at this point to my co-author, Arun Ramanathan. All right. Well, thank you, Carrie, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And you know, before I get into some potential paths forward, uh, noting how complex and political many of those paths are, 
I just want to provide a quick personal reflection um, on one of the main aspects of Prop 13 that really harms our education system, and that's this issue of revenue volatility. Um, as Carrie noted, other states tend to depend more on property taxes and have a much more distributed tax base in California than California. And as a result can have fairly uh, much more steady sources of revenue over the years. What this does is it allows them to avoid what California goes through, which are boom and bust cycles. Um, as Kristen noted in uh, the introduction, in my introduction, um, I had the joy of uh, working in school districts uh, during a period of time when our economy was going through one of those bust cycles, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, because of our heavy dependence on the capital gains of the very richest Californians. Now, I have no problem with that issue, with, with that, or I believe many of you here have no problem with that type of taxation. The challenge is, is that when you overly depend on one level of taxation versus another, when the economy goes bust, when those tax revenues decline precipitously, as they did in 2008, 9, and 10, you see massive cuts happening to schools and social services, and those cuts disproportionately fall on the highest poverty schools and the highest need student populations, uh, often through layoffs of teachers, often through closing, uh, the cancellation of services uh, that are vitally needed. Um, and that is one of the ongoing problems and, and issues in California. And, and it's a basic truth of California, um, but it's often the elephant in the room as to what the cause of that problem is. And I think why we're taking a look at Prop 13 is because at some point we have to discuss that elephant. Now, with the next slide, we have taken steps over the course of the last several years to open the conversation on Prop 13. Uh, Prop 15, a few years ago, was an effort there through the split role, looking at commercial properties. 48% um, of Californians voted in favor, 52% did not, and the, that did not move forward. Uh, Prop 19, same year, was another effort. Um, it did end some of the abuses of the system that allowed people to make a disproportionate amount of money off of property that they may not have been living in. Um, and also did that in a balanced way that allowed folks potentially to move from one uh, place to another, a smaller to a smaller place while retaining some of their property tax advantages, right? We know that this, that this type of compromise often is the compromise that's needed to resolve an issue that is so deeply embedded and is causing such significant injustices. It's not gonna get corrected um, in a uh, sudden and quick form. And many of the things that we bring up in the report are things that have been discussed uh, over the course of the history of Prop 13. Um, as the slide notes, voters and lawyers, lawmakers could lift the caps on assessed value, increase tax rates and pros imposed property sur surcharges, all of these are politically complex, challenging uh, issues in a state where the legislature and the governor often aren't even willing to say the words Proposition 13. And then you could do these sometimes in terms, you could do these in, in combination with means testing. Uh, you could balance this out, noting we have no desire to see people who've been living in their homes for a long time, are low income and fixed income, suddenly face gigantic tax bills. But you can do things such as phase in deferments and protections to avoid that scenario. And then you could address potentially, perhaps as a first step, some of the more um, inequitable aspects of the model, the ones that Carrie have noted that have resulted in extraordinary increases in housing wealth for only one segment of our population, um, older white homeowners. And the closure of in inheritance loopholes allows them to pass that on through generations, allowing for this type of generational inequity to be embedded in the fabric of California. So these are ways policymakers and voters could address these inequities. Next slide, please. Uh, they could also address them in ways that allow Californians to vote for more revenue. Uh, we could 
expand lo local taxation authority, allow for regional taxation as long as dollars are equally distributed regionally. Um, and this notes the issue again, uh, that California has long had this push for distributional equity, but also at the same time has essentially prevented voters from allowing uh, schools to or, and communities to achieve that distributional equity in a sustainable fashion, right? Because of this revenue volatility and this lack of a consistent revenue base for taxes in our, in our state. Let's go to the next slide. And more interestingly, and I think this is one of the real uh, potentials of this report, and in fact, the further analysis that we're looking for, we really should interrogate whether Prop 13 exacerbates inequities from an advocacy and legal perspective. Now, litigation around Prop 13 uh, is many decades old, um, but that actually happened before these shifts that Carrie describes, right? The shift in uh, California's population, the shift in some of the benefits and who accrues those benefits as a result of a, a law that is decades old. Sometimes a law, you know, there's not a, a racist uh, intention in it, but the way it operates is actually very unjust and racist. And that comes out over the course of the decades. Uh, and, very, and that I would describe the way that Prop 13 has operated from a structural way. And so I would say again, advocates and lawyers uh, should take a deep look into this and we should build a deeper research base and craft policy options uh, that bring um, a lot of different folks together. Again, let's pull the elephant out of the room. We're never gonna get to a solution in California on funding for schools and social services and the things that we care about. We're never gonna fix the problems that we see every day until we actually address that elephant. And that's gonna take a lot of folks with different perspectives sitting at tables and hashing things out. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Arun and Carrie. Uh, now we're going to transition to our panel discussion and we hope you'll, uh, for the audience, we hope you join this discussion by submitting questions uh, for the panelists via the Q&A box. And when you ask a question, please include your name, your organization, and where you're joining us from so we know who you are. Uh, speaking of where you're joining us from, uh, if you all are in Los Angeles, uh, welcome to Thunderstorms. Um, I know that's not the norm for us, but here we go. Uh, we also invite you to share what you're hearing via social media. Please use the hashtag unjustlegacy. Um, and don't forget to tag at opportunityorg and at pivot learning uh, and the speakers as well, if you hear something that, that's interesting. Uh, we will start with some quick introductions for our panel. Uh, we'll bring Arun and Carrie back for this panel discussion. Uh, additionally, we will have Ben Grief joining. Uh, ben is the Executive Director for Evolve California, a grassroots nonprofit organization based in San Francisco that he helped found in 2011. Evolve California's work to fully fund California's public schools is guided by their commitment to equality, equity, and empowering local communities. For the past nine years, Ben has led Evolve California's campaign to reform Proposition 13. His work has helped change the political narrative around a once untouchable issue that is the root cause of California's drastically underfunded public education system. In 2020, Ben was on the executive committee for the Schools and Communities First Initiative that sought to reform Prop 13 for commercial properties. Welcome, Ben. Additionally joining us is Dr. Manuel Pastor, a distinguished professor of sociology and American studies at studies and ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He currently directs the Equity Research Institute at USC. Dr. Pastor's research has generally focused on issues of the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low-income urban communities and the social movement seeking to change those realities. 2021 saw a publication of two new books, Solidarity Economics, Why Mutuality and Movements Matter, and South Central Dreams, Finding Home and Building Community in South LA. Dr. Pastor holds an economics PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is the inaugural holder of the Tarpangian Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC. Welcome panelists. 
Uh, to start off our conversation, I think I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Pastor first. Uh, and please correct me if I am mispronouncing your name so that I don't do it for the duration of the events. Um, you've written extensively about Prop 13's origins and have described it as an assault on the American dream. Can you give us a little history and background us uh, in for our discussion? Certainly, Cleanne, and uh, great to be with you. And uh, it's Pastor with a little bit of a roll at the end. Uh, let's see if we can roll it together. This I got it, great. Pastor. You got it. Okay, so um, this is a subject very dear to my heart. Uh, I actually graduated from college in 1978. I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, which meant that at our graduation ceremony, nobody had caps and gowns uh, and it was quite hippie-esque. Uh, but nonetheless, I was asked to speak at our graduation ceremony on behalf of the class. And while I know that what I should have done was thank my immigrant parents for their hard work and inspiration, like Maria Echeveste just did earlier. Instead, what I talked about on behalf of the class was the recent passage of Proposition 13 and how it was likely to shipwreck the finances of the Golden State. Because one of the things that we realized was that in our own pursuit of the California dream, we had benefited from a generation that had been willing to make the investments in infrastructure, in water and highways that was actually necessary in California at that time, in the expansion of housing so that people could find a place to live, and certainly in what was called the master plan, the investment in higher education, the UC system, community colleges, and the Cal State. We also benefited at that period of time from a robust economy, growing jobs in the middle, which meant that someone like my dad, who had a sixth grade education, could go from being a janitor to being an air conditioner repairman. And the family could go from being poor to being working class. And we actually also had a state that was welcoming. It was trying to attract people from other states and people from other nations to come and contribute. And we were making the investments that the next generation would need to survive. And what I felt at that time was that Proposition 13 was an act of lifting up the drawbridges, of saying that we are going to protect our particular property values uh, and burdens from property taxes and deny the investments that will be necessary for the next generation. Now, Proposition 13 was addressing a real issue. And the issue was high inflation, driving up housing prices, leading to increases in assessed values that were, for example, pricing out seniors who were on fixed income who couldn't afford the tax increases. That was a problem that could have been fixed with a scalpel. And instead, what we used was a sledgehammer, the sledgehammer of Proposition 13. And perhaps one of the worst things about this was that after Proposition 13 led to a big shortfall in revenues for the state, the governor, wanting to avoid the political damage at that time, wound up using the budget surplus to paper over the differences for a year or two, which gave people the idea that Proposition 13 had denied revenues, but had been painless to the state. But what happened was that the pain began to show up later as we moved from being among the top 10 states in terms of education spending to being amongst the bottom 10 states in terms of education spending, a situation we've only begun to rectify in the last couple of years. Now, there's some discussion, Arun led it, about the impact of this uh, in terms of racial disparities. And it's important to realize the difference, as he mentioned, between intention and impact. And certainly the way that this has played out is that when you've got older, white, incumbent landowners, homeowners, who benefited from generations of uh, redlining and racial discrimination and lending, et cetera, and they were able to lock in early, then they are able to gain advantages over time as their property values go up 
but not their property taxes. Where I live, for example, a young black lawyer moved in across the street. She was paying about $9,000 a year at, in property taxes. Two blocks over, an older white couple who'd owned that home for a much longer time uh, had a home that was worth three times the value, but they were paying less than $2,000. So locked in, uh, racialized disadvantages. And believe me, the police didn't come any quicker to her house than to the other house. Uh, the street wasn't any cleaner in front of her house than in front of the other house. So structural disadvantages that have persisted. But I do want to say that it is important to realize that the same people who fought for Prop 13 in 1978 fought against school busing to desegregate, struggled to put anti-immigrant laws into place, fought to pass Prop 14 in 1964, which was a proposition to get rid of fair housing laws in the state of California, a, uh, was passed overwhelmingly by voters and then struck down by the Supreme Court. And then finally, the decade that Prop 13 uh, was passed, was the decade in California's history in which the share of children who are children of color grew as a percent of children by more than at any other time in California's history before or since. So I don't know what the intentions were, but you add all that up, it looks like there could have been some intentions, but certainly there have been very racialized impacts. And we need, as we address it, as Arun was saying, to try to take a scalpel that protects people who ought to be protected and make sure that richer homeowners are actually paying their due share. Thank you so much, Dr. Pastor. Um, also, just a quick announcement, uh, please continue to add questions to the Q&A box. We see them coming in and we'll be able to answer those uh, toward the end of the panel discussion. Um, also, just as a point of privilege, I forgot to say happy Juneteenth to everyone before we got started. Uh, so happy Juneteenth. Um, moving along, uh, we have another question for Ben. Uh, your organization, Evolve California, organizes students, community partners, and civil leaders to advocate for adequate and equitable school funding. There are, of course, a variety of ways to improve school funding, but your organization has repeatedly come back to Prop 13. Tell us about why this issue resonates with your stakeholders and why you think it's important to address. Yeah, thanks for the question, Kristen. I think for us, when we really surveyed the landscape, it's impossible not to talk about Prop 13 when we're talking about increasing funding for public schools. You know, as Dr. Pastor mentioned, we went from the top 10 to the bottom 10 in education funding, and that was pre and post Prop 13. So, you know, for us, when we started our campaign about nine years ago to reform the commercial side of Prop 13, um, we did that because we thought it had just been an impossibility to not continue to try to increase funding in a way that kind of was pretty common sense. Um, when we looked at where we were in California, we realized that we already had the highest income taxes in the country. We already have the highest sales tax rate in the country. Uh, we have the second highest gas tax in the country, a few pennies behind Pennsylvania. And so at the same time, we're also having local parcel taxes and bond measures being put forth by cities, counties, and school districts year after year, just to try to cover up the fact that we don't have reliable property tax money that other states have for their schools and their communities. And so, you know, for us, this is like, again, I keep saying it's just common sense to take a look at how can we put our state on par with how the rest of the country taxes their uh, commercial and industrial property. So, you know, when we talk about reforming Prop 13, my organization has always been specifically talking about, you know, that side. And I think it's important to note that most people in California don't even realize that Prop 13 is so broad and that it does cover commercial and industrial property. You know, we always like to mention to folks that Prop 13's corporate loophole allows some of the wealthiest corporations in the world, like Chevron and Disney, to still be paying property taxes based on what their land was worth in the 1970s. Right? That is the most egregious aspect of Prop 13, and that's something that needs to be addressed 
right away. Um, because in total over the last 40 plus years now, we've lost $150 billion from Prop 13. That's money that should be going to our schools and our communities. And that's just from Prop 13's corporate loophole. So these are some of the really common sense solutions that we can look at when we say we live in a state that we care about equity, that we care about education funding. And if we're not looking at these common sense solutions, then maybe we should take a second look at ourselves in California and say, do we really care about our schools? Do we really care about equity? You know, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. And yet, you know, for decades, our schools have been down with, you know, Texas and Tennessee and Mississippi in terms of per student funding. And that's just wrong. And what we've done, I mentioned, we've had some Band-Aid fixes, you know, in terms of parcel taxes and bond measures, but we have to take a closer look at that is how much are these local revenue measures for and in which communities are these local revenue measures being passed? And what we see time and again is we have wealthier, wider communities that are able to tap in to a bigger revenue stream locally than our lower income communities of color. You know, you have enormous parcel taxes for schools going to or from places like Piedmont or Palo Alto or Manhattan Beach or Beverly Hills, um, while lower income communities, generally communities of color, don't have that ability to say, yeah, we're going to put a thousand dollar parcel tax on the ballot and we're going to pass it with 66.6 percent .6 of the vote which also is another reason that we should be talking about Prop 13 is the fact that we're the only place that I know of in the world where if you put something on the ballot, it requires a two thirds supermajority to pass. I'm in San Francisco and a bond for $400 million for public transportation just failed, but it got over 60% of the vote. So that's something we should also be highlighting and talking about is why is it so difficult to raise revenue and what were the real motivations behind this um, law originally. So for our organization, it's really impossible not to be talking about these things when we're talking about funding schools. And really what we feel is that voters are sort of understanding a little bit more now about how Prop 13 maybe isn't the best thing in the world. All aspects of it might be a little bit of an issue. Some things that voters know they like. They like that their primary home is, has property taxes that are kept at a certain rate. But there's other things about Prop 13 that I think voters are starting to realize and starting to say, yes, this is something that we do definitely want to change. And um, we're hoping that we can continue to have this conversation about some of these other aspects. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh my next question is for Carrie. As the co-author of this report, you say reforming Prop 13 could generate additional revenue for schools, yet the state is going to break all sorts of budget records this year with a surplus of tens of billions of dollars. Do we really need to touch Prop 13? So um, great question. And yes, we're in a, um, a good place in this budget year when it comes to education. Um, now the budget projections for this year were we came in before the um, the economy started to dip in recent months, and so we um, we can't expect or bank on those kinds of revenues in future years. But the important thing to point out here is what what Arun raised earlier is that we have tremendous volatility in our in our revenue generating system in California, and that directly affects schools. Schools rely. Um, significantly on state revenues, more in California than most other states. Most other states have a different kind of mix of local and state revenues. In California, we lean on that state general fund, and that state general fund is highly volatile because it's comprised mostly of personal income taxes, which are heavily dependent on capital gains. Um, so when the economy does very well, as it has in the most recent couple of years, Schools do really well too, but when the economy does poorly, schools really suffer. We saw this during the Great Recession when we saw cuts of $2,000 per pupil, and that was back in 2008, 2009. Um, what would that be in today's dollars? It's, it's, it's really a staggering amount of money and has a profound impact on what can happen in schools. It leads to reductions in staff. It leads to reductions in opportunities, arts, music, extracurriculars, dual enrollment, all kinds of things that we know our kids need. Um, so that boom and bust cycle um, is the, the most important thing to consider. But the other thing is that I think we need to rethink 
the property tax as a, a meaningful and um, stable and predictable source of revenue that if handled in a different way could actually be equitable. I think property taxes have gotten a bad rap in education finance because there's a history of connecting uh, zoning and, and neighborhood schooling, which we know is you know nested in a, a history and a legacy of redlining and exclusion and segregation to school funding. And there's a direct link between neighborhoods and school funding, and therefore between property taxes and funding. And so in many states, look at Illinois, for example, you see huge inequities in funding by school district. California has started to head in the right direction when it comes to progressive school funding. We passed the local control funding formula in 2013 that started to equitably distribute state dollars we could think differently about both generating more stable revenues through the property tax, but also distributing them more equitably, considering things like regional models. Think about transportation. We think of transportation as a regional good and tax it and fund it at a regional level, not at a, a community, you know, narrow community level. What if education were seen as a community or regional good and resource and required both raising money and sharing money across a wider range of school districts to ensure equitable opportunities? I think those are the kinds of creative solutions we're eager to talk with people about. Thanks so much for that. Um, and then Arun, as the, the co-author of this report, uh, we know that Prop 13 doesn't mention anything about race. Can you explain how it contributes to racial inequities in California? So I think that was essentially the uh, presentation that Carrie gave, right? Um, what you've seen is the benefit was largely accrued, right? By a largely white, older population. And that benefit has been maintained over the course of generations because of the ability to pass down that benefit. And again, think about what that benefit means. It means that one set of Californians were able to use their houses. And when you look at the top, uh, I believe it was 10, 20%, right, of housing and the amount uh, of value those houses rose, the ability of folks to use that as a piggy bank, to support the education of their children, to send them to private schools, to send them to college, to do all sorts of different things that you can do when your wealth increases. That element of wealth and wealth accrual was baked in to California's system structurally as a result of Prop 13. Now, that's not doesn't mean that it wasn't also provided to some black Californians and Latino Californians and Asian Californians. But what it what in practical matter, it meant that the people who accrued that benefit early on, when California was 70% white, gained much more from it than people who came in later as part of waves of immigrants or black Californians in general, right? Who do not have property wealth representing their share of California's population. So you can stick a Black Lives Matter sign on your front lawn, but if you're not actually paying any taxes relative to what you should be on a multi-million dollar house, where that lawn, sit, that lawn sign sits, how much do the black and brown and Asian lives of students that populate our California classrooms actually matter? And I think that's one of the fundamental questions that Californians have to ask themselves. Because if a policy results again in this intergenerational benefit for only one group of Californians based on race, a lot, you know, and the end result is that other groups of Californians are disproportionately negatively benefited otherwise. Um, you, you can say that the policy itself was not racist when it was developed, but it has flowed out structurally in a racist way, much like redlining, but much more uh, pernicious in many ways than redlining. What you said just reminded me of a post on social media that went viral about a Black woman who was 
purchasing a home for the first time and the lender said, can't you just have a relative gift you the down payment? It's a fairly common practice. And the post ended in, and that's the 400 year head start we don't have here. So next, I would like to talk to Dr. Pastor. Um, you've, you've described Proposition 13 as generational warfare. Uh, can you share with us why you see this measure as an issue of intergenerational equity and why its impact has been so long lasting? Um, and then also, why should young Californians who hope to own a home someday here, uh, what should they take away from this report? And why does home ownership matter in the grand scheme of things? It's a lot of questions. I hope you got that. Yeah, and I'll try to be quick. I think I went one minute over the last time. So unlike most academics, I try to then give the time back. Um, so, you know, this was a declaration of an older generation saying we're going to protect our low tax assessments and starve uh, the education that people will need to be able to succeed and make sure that all new homeowners, as Arun was mentioning, come in paying full freight. And I think that's been the challenge for a lot of young uh, Californians right now. If you're trying to jump into the housing market, it's extraordinarily expensive. You've got a lot of student debt because unlike when I was coming through and tuition was pretty close to zero. Uh, tuition is not close to zero at all and people accumulate a lot of debt. And on top of that, you've got a kind of economy that's got a lot more insecurity in it than there's ever been before. And so I do think that young Californians definitely feel like older Californians have been handing them not a new deal or a good deal, but a bad deal. And that older Californians have been patting ourselves on the back about how hard we worked to get ahead when essentially we benefited from so much state largesse in terms of public spending, building out of housing, building out of infrastructure, the educational system. And it is time for an older generation to make sure that a younger generation succeeds. And I think that that's part of the, what those of us who are a bit older, I just turned 66. I keep telling people, I think it's the new 65, um, that uh, what those of us who are older should actually step up to do is to recognize what we've done in the state and what we need to do now in the state to make it possible for young people to succeed. I have a 35 year old son and a 32 year old uh, daughter. Uh, both of them saddled with college debt, neither of them in any kind of position to buy a house. Um, they need uh, to know that, you know, you could do, and someone was suggesting this, you could do a reform of Prop 13 that would raise some revenue, but actually could lower the taxes, lowering the effective rate that Carrie was talking about for some of the newer, younger homeowners buying in at this time. You could help young people with reform. Thank you so much for that. My next question uh, is for everyone, and I think we'll start with Ben. Um, in 2020, voters had a chance to reform Prop 13 by taxing commercial properties at market value. That effort, Prop 15, narrowly lost at the ballot box. What lessons do we take away from that campaign, which was called Schools and Community First, and the outcome? Uh, we'll start with Ben, we'll go to Dr. Pastor, and then anyone else who wants to jump in. Yeah, that's a great question. I think there were a lot of lessons learned. Um, I think the number one thing is in that election, we learned that Prop 13 isn't the third rail of California politics, the way folks for the last you know several decades at the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association have led us to believe. You know, we had dozens of assembly members and senators and hundreds of local elected officials, as well as Governor Newsom, support uh, Prop 15. And they didn't get recalled, right? It, it, there was this whole, you know, brigade of homeowners with pitchforks that was ready to kick them out of office. And I think that's important because they have created this myth around Prop 13. And if you touch it, like the third rail, you're going to die. But that's not the case, right? If you do have a common sense reform, that's more of a scalpel type reform, that is something that many voters would support. We came very close, but I think the other thing that we learned is that the other side will do anything 
to keep the special deal for corporations and wealthy commercial property owners. You know, they came at us with all kinds of crazy lies. You know, your prices of goods and services are going to go up even though there's absolutely no correlation between property taxes and the price of goods and services, they're determined by the market. You know, they, they said that this is going to, you know, somehow, you know, hurt small businesses, even though we had a small business carve out and actually rents are not based on the property taxes that are paid by the landlord. Right. There's absolutely no evidence to show that rents are based on the market. If the corporate loophole in Prop 13 was keeping our rents down, then we would have the lowest rents in the country. But we don't. We have the highest rents in the country. And so these are some important things that we need to do to educate more people um, in the years before we want to have this on the ballot again. We need to be out there organizing. We need to be inoculating people against these lies. And I think we also need to do uh, a better job of really talking to people about what it means to rank so low in education funding. I think we're having a better conversation now about the mental health crisis that's happening with our young people today. Um, and so let's look at the fact that California ranks last in nurses, last in social workers, right? Really low in psychologists. Um, these are the things that we need to fund, right? To make sure that our young people are able to succeed, right? We shouldn't be last in counselors either, which we are. So I think there's a lot of education to be done, um, but we're very um, optimistic about how well we did on the first time in you know, 42 years to actually take on uh, this corporate loophole. So I'll comment on that too. Um, I think it's important to realize that the margin of defeat was four percentage points. And let me say a couple of things about that. First, one of the main groups along with many others uh, pushing for Prop 15 uh, was the Million Voters Project. And the record on the Million Voters Project is that when it has a ground game, it usually beats the polls by four percentage points. So, uh, but it was very hard to have a ground game in the midst of COVID. You could have a phone game, but you couldn't have the sort of high touch knocking on doors, kind of get out the vote that probably would have tipped Prop 15 into winning. Second, it was put on the ballot in a year that nobody was expecting COVID. And that COVID not only kicked out the ground game, but it also meant that particularly at that time, there was a lot of economic uncertainty. Nobody knew what COVID was going to do to the economy. And so the argument that you shouldn't raise taxes in a recession wound up having salience with people. Even though if you looked at Prop 15, it wasn't gonna raise taxes immediately, it was gonna stabilize the tax structure two, three years out, because it would take time to implement. But that was the argument that was made at that time. And then third, although, Ben is right that political leaders wound up realizing that supporting Prop 15 didn't actually hurt them politically. Some of them, including Gavin Newsom, came across the line to support it pretty much at the last minute. And now that they know that it can actually pass, that it comes that close, um, if you line up a ground game, a different economy, and a little bit more political leadership, that's a very different vote than what happened in uh, 2020. So uh, it's very uh, easy when you are just looking at the sort of bottom line numbers to read it one way, but if you actually contextualize it, I think what Ben is saying is right, is that there's tremendous support, particularly if the message could get out about using a scalpel rather than a sledgehammer. The carve outs that they were there for small businesses and small property holders, I think those are the kind of things that need to be stressed. Thank you. Would anyone else like to answer? Well, we can move right along. Uh, really quickly, I, I saw uh, in the Q&A, uh, we are keeping track of your questions to answer uh, later on at the end of this panel. Um, and someone had asked uh, if these questions were pre-planned. Uh, the answer is yes, after reading the report in order to uh, effectively moderate, I have to create questions in advance uh, so that I don't get on the screen and start talking about other random things. So yes, but the Q&A session will follow and we will be able to utilize all of your questions in the chat. So if you have questions, please drop them in there. Um, let's see. Uh, 
The most recent polls on Prop 13, they report about 60% of voters in California think Prop 13 is mostly a good thing for the state. How do you reconcile that with this report that po points out so many problems? Um, Arun, would you like to start there? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, it is, uh, you know, deeply embedded in California's fabric. What do they call it? The third rail of California, right? Until uh, ban and evolve and a whole set of folks um, pressed to make a change in one uh, scalpel-like effort on that third, third rail. Uh, and, you know, it is also deeply embedded um, because the benefit is accrued uh, across a, a range of, of constituencies, right? So um, the question really is, I think, whether or not um, you get to a point in the state. Well, first of all, I think the beginning of that is this paper actually looking at the history of Prop 13 and looking at the impacts from a racial equity lens, right? I think... Um, We've never had that particular conversation before, and we've never had it in California within also the context of an increased awareness of the importance of racial equity, right? So um, my question really, uh, you know, emerging from that is whether or not that conversation will lead those two conversations can merge and lead into, uh, you know, the potential for change, right? And I think this is a first step in that effort. I think the other part of it too is um, you don't have to have uh, all the folks in favor of something to take a look at something from a legal angle and to determine whether or not something uh, is racially inequitable. And we've had many significant changes in policy come about uh, as a result of that. Redlining was greatly beneficial as a whole host of racially inequity, inequitable policies that a lot of voters supported and were unwilling to change at the ballot box, right? Our, hist our nation's history is filled with them. But I think, again, the question back to Californians, given, as Carrie has noted, this is atypical nationally. We, we like to bash Florida and Texas but they're raising a lot more property tax revenue than we are, which is a consistent form of revenue. Are we going to actually match our progressive rhetoric at some point with actually progressive policies? Um, and uh, and that, that's a fair question back to Californians writ large. Thank you so much. Uh, ben, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, I think that the, the polling question is a, a perfect example of sort of what we have in terms of like the Sacramento establishment asking a broad question and using that as a reason not to pursue any change in this law, right? Um, because most voters aren't familiar with Prop 13 because it passed 44 years ago, right? So if they were 18 years old, then they're fairly old now. Um, secondly, um, if they do know something about Prop 13, they know that it keeps their primary residence property taxes down. They don't know some of the other things that we've been discussing today. And I think that is where a better question would be. It's like, do you think it makes sense that Donald Trump pays not fair market value property taxes on his properties in California, especially his golf course in Southern California, where he has to pay fair market value for Trump Tower in New York and for Mar-a-Lago in Florida, right? It, is that the kind of state you wanna live in, right? So if we ask that, then we would see probably 64% supporting changing that. And I think those are the types of questions that we need to be asking. I think the other thing to really think about is that voters are understanding that corporations aren't paying what they owe right now. Right, that, that we're gone through this two years of a pandemic that has hurt working people, right? While corporations are making an enormous amount of money and the wealthy 1% have made an enormous amount of money too. So when we talk about ways to take a scalpel to Prop 13, that's what we should be doing is we should be talking about who is benefiting the most, how is that hurting all of us? And how can we now make changes to make this more equitable? I think the last thing that people don't really understand is that Prop 13 was passed uh, to keep property taxes down um, for homeowners. But actually what we've seen is today, 
72% of property taxes are coming from residential property, where only 28% are coming from commercial and industrial property. Where back in 1978, the split was 55-45. And so these are the types of questions we have to be asking. I talked earlier about how high our other taxes are. While well, Prop 13 might be keeping property taxes down for a certain number of homeowners, it's certainly not helping new homeowners, and it's increased all of our other taxes in every measurable way. So those are the types of things I think we should be asking about instead of this broad, is Prop 13 popular or not? Would anyone else like to answer this question before we move on? All right, this is uh, our last prepared question, lightning round. It's for everyone, so anyone who wants to jump in can. It's taken 40 years to have a conversation about Proposition 13. What gives you hope that it can be reformed now? And I'm gonna say ladies first, Carrie. Yeah, I'll jump in there. We've talked about it on this in this conversation already. We, we are talking about racial inequality in America now. We were not talking about it 40 years ago. We are having a different conversation. There's a different awareness of how our values and our policies are out of step with each other. And we've seen that the disparities in access to housing and opportunity have grown dramatically in recent years. They're getting worse, not better. And we're talking about how we can repair the harms we've done as a state. This should be part of that conversation. And I think there's an opportunity to connect it to that, that reparations conversation. So, I mentioned earlier how close Prop 15 came and that gives me a little bit of hope. But during the campaign around Prop 15, I had a conversation with a younger business leader who actually said something very interesting akin to what Arun was saying, which is he said that in the firm in which he worked, he was going through lots of conversations about uh, structural racism after the murder of George Floyd. And after having all of those conversations that he felt like he could not go back to his employees and seriously say that he wasn't going to support Prop 15 because if anything was going to tackle something that was in effect structural racism, that was Prop 15. So what kind of gives me a little bit of hope is that there is a desire to recognize these issues, and then we may have some unusual allies. This Prop 15, uh, Prop 13, uh, both the commercial side and even the residential property side is what economists think of as the worst possible tax, because you've got two things of equivalent value that you're taxing at very different rates. And so that is really inelegant. So I think there's a kind of business appeal about this. I think there's a generational appeal. I think it's time, as Arun was saying, Carrie as well, to simply have a different conversation and let cooler ads prevail around what the scalpel is and not be waving the flag of the sledgehammer. I'll, yeah, I'll... I, I would add to that, that I've always seen Prop 13 as more of a social issue rather than just a tax issue. And what I mean by that is it's more similar to the fight that we had not so long ago over same-sex marriage, where, you know, when that was on the ballot, that did certainly not go the way that many of us in California now would have wanted. Um, or the conversation that we had in 2012, I think, was the first year that we had recreational marijuana on the ballot. And so when we look at those attempts, they failed the first time. Right. But it was an important first step and to have a broader conversation about these issues. And so when we talk about, you know, reforming the commercial side of Prop 13, it's very similar. It's like we have to go out there once we have to have the broader conversation. And now we can go back that more people are aware of this and that they understand this and say, yes, this is something that we want to do. It just takes some time. It takes a lot of education. It takes a lot of organizing. But I think I am very hopeful, especially because Prop 19 did curtail another egregious aspect of Prop 13, right? So that did pass, right? Voters did say, yes, this is what we want to do. So I think there is hope um, for us uh, very much in the future. 
Yeah, I mean, just quickly piggyback on that. Uh, you have to stay hopeful, right? And uh, perhaps uh, those of us in the baby boom and Gen X generations uh, have become entwined in this particular area in a way that, um, you know, we don't see the possibility. Uh, but actually, I started seeing the possibilities when I talked to Ben. Um, and the fact, Kristen, that you're moderating this panel. Uh, and when you think about who's really getting screwed in this, in this structure, it's young Californians. Um, it's young Californians, particularly of color, of who are the majority increasingly of our state population. And so I'll turn to you all uh, to be, you know, kind of the leading edge of that change. Thank you. That concludes our lightning round and we'll transition us to audience questions. Uh, the first is from Tyler. Uh, Tyler says, would it be more ideal to repeal Prop 13 or reform Prop 13? How do we bridge the gap between our education ecosystem and housing market for low income folks? And what are some of the first steps towards sustainable reform? I think we can probably go with two short responses. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly say that I think that the idea of a complete repeal is unrealistic because Prop 13 is so interwoven with so many other policies. There have been so many ballot measures and legislative actions that have followed that have um, baked Prop 13 into the structure of our public finance system. And we need to pull a thread at a time to unravel the things that aren't working and in the process, recreate something. Um, we, we've heard the analogy of a scalpel in this conversation. That, that's one way to think about it, but I think we also need to tr trace how each thread is connected to other things um, and figure out what the, the offsetting effect of one change might be, um, because we know that everything is connected. So if we, if we increase one tax, we might see another tax fall. We need to think about those kinds of offsetting implications. Um, we, we, we know that when Prop 13 was passed, the, the savings and taxes were essentially capitalized into housing prices and housing got more expensive as taxes fell. And so things kind of, kind of offset um, each other. We need to figure those things out one by one rather than take on the thing wholesale. That, that's my view. Anyone else wanna hop in here? All right, moving on to Lynn from the Bay Area. Any way to take a scalpel to the two thirds majority for passage of local bond requirements of Pop, Prop 13? As in Washington, DC, this makes, almost, this makes it almost impossible to get things done, i.e. pass a school bond. Uh, quickly, I think that's also a difficult political lift. And I think that one of the things to be thinking about with that in terms of reform is lowering at least the threshold. Um, so, you know, we're now able to pass a budget with 50%, able to pass different kinds of things with 55%. So maybe if you are talking about raising revenues, you want to have something that's a little bit more than 50 plus one, but two thirds makes it nearly impossible. And you wind up, uh, I mean, to get, try to get two thirds of the people to agree on anything in California, except maybe that the new Beyonce album is worth uh, a listen. Uh, you know, I think that's just a big haul. So we certainly need to lower that threshold and be more realistic. I just like to jump in and I agree. I think we can lower the threshold. I know we've lowered the threshold for school bonds to 55%. I think this is low hanging fruit for the legislature if there's appetite for it. And, you know, I, I just do want to say something about the last question. Um, there's no organization in California that's talking about repealing Prop 13, right? When, when we, we hear things like that, that is the other side trying to say that's what we want to do. But that's not something that any, I've been in this space for a decade now, no one's talking about doing that. We're just talking about reform in really a common sense way. Thank you. Uh, next up, Angelina has asked, who are the biggest opponents to fair market value property tax assessments in California? And how can grassroots organizers and advocates assist you in educating voters on the unjust consequences of Prop 13? 
Ben, I feel like that's a you question. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think any organization that's interested in learning more about this and interested in learning about the efforts that are being put forward now to reform Prop 13, I, you know, encourage you to, you know, get in contact with, you know, the, the, the folks here, um, get in contact with myself to, to hear more about what we're doing, because we really do need more of a grassroots effort. This has to be something that all of us are talking about. We see so many grassroots efforts on other issues, but this issue is the underlying issue right for California and so yeah I, I definitely encourage folks to you know who are interested to to be involved there's a lot of opportunities you know we are you know my organization is part of a much larger statewide coalition um, that was behind the prop 15 effort and um, we certainly be happy to, to talk to anyone who's interested in in learning more and joining if I could just piggyback just really quickly on that I think it's very important to highlight and, and this is why we noted this in the report, the connections between Prop 13 and the revenue volatility and the lack of revenue to things in California, like the fact that we have the highest counselor to student ratios, right? The lowest nurse to student ratios, um, that uh, our housing affordability is, is, is extremely low, um, that we have some of the most challenging uh, efforts to get into, you know, our state universities, this lowest acceptance rates. And so the, um, you know, the availability of all of these things are absolutely critical to the future of young Californians. We have to start framing things within that context. Thank you. Uh, and from Lewis, I have, to what extent do you think the defeat of Prop 15 makes reform of Prop 13 much more difficult or unlikely. I think we briefly touched on this before. Um, ben, was that you? Yeah, I, I think Dr. Pastor and I both mentioned that because the margin was so small and also because this was the first time in 42 years anyone had ever tried to put something on the ballot around Prop 13, that actually it increases our chances of success in the future. And because of the incredibly unusual conditions of that particular election. Um, let's see, uh, Sarah, um, a program manager with Pivot asks, why have other states not followed California's lead in passing such sweeping property tax capping measures? Well, they have. Um, Prop 13 uh, <laughs> unleashed a wave of uh, property tax limitations across the United States was quickly captured in Massachusetts. And the idea, for example, that uh, you could uh, cut taxes and not suffer any loss on the sort of spending side, again, something cushioned by Governor Jerry Brown at the time, was essentially what Ronald Reagan uh, ran with uh, going to the White House, owning Proposition 13 as something that he had supported, then saying that we could cut taxes at the federal level, which is of course what happened during the early years of the Reagan administration, blowing a gigantic hole in the deficit that was later corrected. You know, uh, there's a great uh, expression uh, for folks who follow Latin American literature, magical realism, which is that you just imagine something is true and you think it's real. Um, and I think that's been a lot of the story around Prop 13. And I think one of the things that's come up in the Q&A is that what about that older black homeowner who's low income in Oakland? Isn't she protected by Proposition 13? You know what? She is. But so are lots of very, very rich people protected by Proposition 13. And surely there's a way to create a carve out that would protect her. And I find it striking that the same people who keep raising that argument around Prop 13 are generally in the same camp as people are saying, we shouldn't cancel student debt because a few richer individuals might benefit from it. We need to design programs that target who we think needs the relief. And we need to consider when we've got perhaps unintended consequences, such as the racialized impacts and intergenerational impacts of Prop 13. You know, I'd like to add to that. I, I think, 
th there's some great points there. But when we look at sort of what happened right after Prop 13 passed, there were about 43 copycat measures all across the state to curtail property taxes, but not one of them included commercial property because that doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> Right. No voter in Massachusetts or Florida or any other places like, yeah, let, let, let's give a huge tax break to commercial property owners. Right. So that is how out of step California is uh, on this. And I think it's also important to know who are the people that who are the organizations that are behind supporting this system that isn't really working for very many of us and is hurting our schools and hurting our communities. And when we look at who funded the anti Prop 15 campaign, we see the California Business Roundtable spending like $78 million against our measure, right? That should not be the case. Who are these people, right? Why are they pushing their worldview? Many of them are also supporting other Republican folks, you know, Ron DeSantis, you know, supporting Trump candidates. They're having an outsized influence on California and what we're doing. So we really need to look at who is behind the efforts that are stopping these common sense reforms, I think. And I think we'll have more of those conversations moving forward so voters can understand, you know, wait, we're on California side. We care about our schools. We care about our communities. We're not at the forefront of this right wing anti-tax movement that unfortunately we started, you know, 44 years ago. Um, but that's certainly not how we identify here now, or the majority of us at least. Thank you. So at this time, I would like to um, bring in Professor Chris Edley uh, for uh, a couple of more questions. Can we spotlight Chris? And thank you to all of our panelists who've joined us today. We really appreciate all of your insight. Uh, thanks, Kristen. Listen, I only have about 90 seconds of thought uh, on this. Can I just dump it out and... Sure. And then I have a question from the audience for you. Oh, you do? Yes. Well, let's do that first. Let's okay, do that first. great. Let's do um, what I have is, does the research justify another attempt at overturning Prop 13 through the courts? For example, do you think this research shows that Prop 13 violates the Equal Protection Clause or the Federal Fair Housing Act? I think there are... Uh, some advocates, some legal advocates who would say it's worth a shot, uh, at least in state court. Um, I am pretty confident that it would be unsuccessful uh, in the judiciary, but it may be that litigation is a good organizing tool for, uh, for political action. So that's a possibility. But if you just look at the composition of the federal and state courts uh, and the recent trend in rulings, um, it's more than a stretch. Uh, it's more than a leap to believe that our remedy is there. Look, I, look, I, I know that there's some question in people's minds. Um, is this really a civil rights issue? Um, well, first I wanna say civil rights isn't only about anti-discrimination. Uh, it's also about meaningful opportunity. Um, and it isn't only about what judges will do, but it's what can we get into public policy through statutes and regulations. Uh, so yes, it's a civil rights issue, but uh, but it's more than that. Um, what the panelists have said makes clear that it's a social justice issue uh, as well as a civil rights issue. And that means the potential coalition is much broader than it might otherwise be. I also think it's important uh, to bear in mind that if, at least when I look nationally, I sense uh, the ebbing strength of calls for equity and racial justice in political and policy contexts. Indeed, we've seen in several states that the key actors 
who uh, who view themselves as equity warriors uh, try to avoid using the word. Uh, it may not amount to a backlash, but I think it is it is fading in salience much faster than I thought it would. Uh, California, it's not happening as much in California yet, but uh, this is a very blue state. Um, and, uh, and the demography is very different from the rest of the country. Uh, but I think it's a very, uh, it's a very, cal very careful calculation to be made uh, about the use of racial justice and equity claims in a broad forum. Uh, this instead, we're gonna make progress, I think, uh, with sort of different strokes for different folks. Uh, there's not gonna be one message uh, that works for a, a majority of voters. Um, it's gonna be several different messages uh, and there has to be a sophisticated strategy for knowing when and where to, to, to deploy them. But perhaps the biggest challenge, and I'll, I'll close with, I'll close with this. I think it is. An, I think it is an amazing report. It is really rich, and it's actually, for a piece of, for a piece of research, quite inspiring. Um, however, uh, we're going through something now, in which the power of evidence is yielding to the power of the big lie. Um, and uh, given changes in social media, changes in so-called mainstream media, uh, the pace of the news cycle, it's very, very difficult to fight the big lie as we're finding out, as we're finding out. So the evidence in the report is uh, invaluable, but not valuable enough to win the fight in these times, I fear. Thank you so much for that. And in an effort to get through as many audience questions as I could, I failed to properly introduce you. And for oh, that, I apologize. I'm a guy. <laughs> it's fine. I just, I wanted to I'm make old. sure. Listen, <laughs> we have to give flowers while we're here. So uh, Professor Edley has spent 40 years influencing public policy and teaching law at Harvard and Berkeley. Uh, he's also the Honorable William H. Org Jr. Distinguished Professor of Law at UC Berkeley School of Law after serving as Dean from 2004 to 2013. Uh, his academic work is in administrative law, civil rights, and education policy, which is why I had to tag him in for that question. Uh, he's the co-founder and president emeritus of the Opportunity Institute. So before we closed, I wanted to make sure we got that out. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Professor, and for that wisdom. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you all, uh, for all to all of you who joined us from home or work and stayed two to three minutes after so that we can hear all of this great information. Uh, with that, I just want to make sure if you have questions that didn't get answered, you can email info at the opportunityinstitute.org for an answer, and you can also continue the conversation on social media uh, using the hashtags that I shared earlier. Uh, with that, have a good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, thanks Kristen. And thanks, Kristen. You did a great job. Thank you.